were armed with a Cambridge University degree. You went to the London Business School. You studied under Charles Handy. You turned down a job with McKinsey. You took on a job in sales with, was it IBM? ICL. 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 The but you also company. were with IBM at some yeah. point. Well, I started with them, yeah. My, yeah. So and the first, you, first you, job at the university, yeah. And then would you say that your book is the biggest bestseller in Australia in nonfiction? I, well, I, I actually find it may, it may have been. I, I, I've never even looked at it that way. I mean, I just looked at it. The book basically was the, le the leverage you got, got me. I, you know, I, I ended up managing five venture capital funds. But the main thing is I became an independent. And, and that was a great advantage. I, but your, but stories I managed to build about, your stories as a venture capitalist, I mean, what a life. But now oh, yeah. you've retired or, or pre-retirement into into emotional intelligence. And now that is your life mission and your passion. And yeah. I, I've just always been in awe of uh, your life story and the, the, the contribution that you make to our knowledge of emotional intelligence, Chris. So your book, your first book, Enterprise and Venture Capital, is the major uh, bestseller. How does uh, the Hum Handbook, which is about emotional intelligence, how does that compare? Is that... No Still comparison. Doing well? No, no, no. It's it's a there, there's a that's that's the interesting contract. I mean, what happened was I wrote empathy selling next because right. What what I'll just tell you, it's very funny stories, etc. The the first story, enterprise and venture capital, is probably I, one one of my great messages in emotional intelligence workshop is that the secret to career success. There's two secrets. The first one is to be good at one on one meetings. And that was the one when you said about Charles Handy. And, and I'll tell that story now if you want. Yes, you... indeed, because I'm a big fan of Charles Handy. Right. And well, Charles I've... Handy, is, is, you know, I mean, a, people, a lot of people, you, you know, your younger viewers wouldn't realize who he is. But during the 1990s, he was the management guru. Fortune magazine said he was the best management guru in the world. But unlike people like Tom Peters, who wrote In Search of Excellence, and who's, he chose 10 excellent companies, and I think... Within five years, three were in liquidation, three were nearly underneath, and only about three were surviving. They said Charles Handy made a number of predictions that all came true. But that's during the 1990s. And when the Harvard Business Review, they published their 75th anniversary edition in 1997, they asked five gurus to write an article. Four were American, and one was from the UK, and it was Charles Handy. That's where he reigned in the pantheon. I mean, because the Harvard Business Review is the you know, the management effectively magazine. And Chris, there is a list of the top 50 thinkers in, in business, and he is one of the 50. Oh, no, so it's right up there, right? Yeah. He's, yeah. Well, That's I was very right. fortunate. He was my tutor, right? I mean, he was dean of the MBA program at London Business School, and I was within the six year I got going. So we'd meet, you know, once, a, you know, fortnight, once a month for lunch, share if we're lucky, or basically a coffee, not so lucky. And, um, I was flown twice to New York, by New York by McKinsey's for interviews. And I got the offer from them. And Charles said to me, Chris, have you managed to find a job yet? Because in 73, there was a bit of a recession on worldwide. And I said, Charles, I've got the big one. McKinsey's in New York, head office. And he looked at me and I've never forgotten that. He said, you know, I'm not sure I'd take it if I were you. And I said, what? And when I described this story to MBA students, they nearly die. He said, I've been thinking about what is the secret to career success. And I'm coming to the conclusion, the secret is to be good at one-on-one -on -one meetings because that's when it happens. He said, that's when you get the job offer, you get funding for your project, you present to your CEO something, you may get fired, you get hired, you hire someone, you fire someone. He said, the secret to career success is to be good at one-on-one -on -one meetings. And he said, we don't teach you how to do that at an MBA. And he said, my suggestion is turn down the job offer for McKinsey's and become a salesperson because if you don't learn how to sell and be good at one-on-one -on -one meetings, you won't eat. Anyway, I ended up following his advice, turned down McKinsey's. They couldn't believe it. They just were absolutely stunned. I think I'm the first person who's ever turned them down, jobs at McKinsey. And one of my colleagues at the business school, his dad was a director of ICL Australia and they were desperate to hire me because I had worked for four years, first with IBM and then on IBM computers. And I said, well, I wanted to go to Australia. So they actually, I ended up being a salesman here in ICL, ICL with ICL Australia. And that was the second big thing, meeting I had because I attended this workshop run by Chandler McLeod where I learned what's called the Hum Wadsworth. And the Hum Wadsworth, got it. That's right, that, and that's the system, right? They use, and which 
effectively as a way of analyzing people according to their temperament. That's their genetic emotional predisposition. And it's a very, very good system. And I, I won't bother to explain it all here. It's all on my website. But th that was a set. So that's my two messages for career success is one, if you can, you basically get into a position where you learn how to sell to be with the idea of being good at one-on-one -on -one meetings. And then second, the secret to being good at one-on-one -on -one meetings is to effectively use the, the well, what, I, what I've now sort of, I've developed the Humboldt's with into a better system, but to use that methodology for profiling people because you learn their emotional wants with their emotional predisposition, predisposition is. So that's the secret. So if they get your book, they'll be able to read all about the different types and also uh, understand strategies of how you, it's part of emotional intelligence is your ability to be flexible and change your natural style to mirror the style of the person you're wanting to influence. Is that it? That's very, very, two sides to it. There's self-awareness and social awareness. Right. Uh, first of all, you learn what you are yes. and you learn what types you basically are, cause have personality dissonance. And secondly, you learn the empathy. You understand the way that people are, other people are, and you learn the social skills to handle them. That's the that's Goldman's definition, which is the one I like. Goldman was the one who wrote emotional intelligence. In yeah, life. Daniel Goldman. Yeah, yeah. The first and that's the book that, 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 that put it in the lexicon. And, and I, I actually first encountered the equivalent of that when I studied NLP, neuro linguistic programming. Yeah. Because it was looking at at a very superficial level to start with that how people speak and the ch their choice of words indicates their thinking preference. Yes. And that if you wanted to influence someone, you chose to mirror their language rather than use what you would normally use yourself. That's, That's if right. you wanted to influence That's them. That's it, right. But yeah. the, 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 the problem with it is that it, you know, NLP actually puts people, as you know, auditory, visual and kinesthetic, puts them like in the boxes. And it's a, it's a type theory. It's, in fact, what I call the big three, NLP, DISC and um, Myers-Briggs, are in fact they're all type theories and right. in fact the modern technique now the modern technology and the one that psychs use is trait theory right and what they what, what, what theory the, i'm sorry mr trait theory it says for example extroversion trait. okay if you take a quality like extroversion which is a trait yes like you have a lot of right is trait theory says there's a feature a, a characteristic or a trait called extroversion yes it's distributed normally one end of the scale of people are introverts and at the other end of people are extroverts, but 67% of the population fall in the middle. Yes. And they're what they call ambiverts. And that's what happens. That's what happens with the trait. It's normally distributed, right? right. Yes. And what happens is, so, but in, in, for example, in Myers-Briggs, you're either an extrovert or an introvert, right? I mean, that's what happens. Second big benefit, I just might mention another, is the biggest mistake managers make was, they follow the rule. We like those people who are like ourselves, right? If someone shares a dominant component and shares a dominant component, you, you may I think, act naturally and they'll like you. Emo they're mostly hook in, okay? But when you're trying to build a team, it's generally important that you build a diverse team and in particularly choose people who aren't the same as you, right? Because otherwise, you tend to have suicide from groupthink, right? And, and people around you. So that can happen very, very often. Right. And it's one of the greatest mistakes. I was working with a team recently that I went, everybody is the same. This isn't good. They haven't got enough diversity. Absolutely. Would you agree that a manager really needs to have some sort of reading on the different types, whether he go, they go for trait theory or whether they go for behavioral theory? And what was the other one? Well, I'm saying it's, it's trait types. versus type, type theory. Type well, theory. yeah, well, if you use type theory, look, the problem is, this is, this is right. it's a bit like your learning experience. The problem is when you first learn a people profiling technique, it's generally a big emotional experience. So you go, oh, it was for me, huh? it was for me. 1997, I've learned the secret of life, right? <laughs> I, it's a massive envy. Not only that, exactly what happens as you go around classifying people according to that methodology, you say, oh, I can see that he, you know, he, he's a high visual and he's a high kinesthetic. Yeah, so it's positively being reinforced, just like you said in your learning, yeah. right? You're okay. So what happens is this is the bane of my life. If people are infected with the first, but they, they have it infected with the first methodology, very very few people can do the change. Right? That is fabulous. Now, can I just fill in for the listeners what the uh, seven types are? Because the artist is one of the types, right? Yes. 
And I know you've said they can look it up on the web, uh, website, but just to remind everybody, you've got the mover, yeah. the double checker, the artist, the politician, the engineer, the hustler, and the normal. Yes. What would be the main advantage of understanding uh, this particular trait model rather than these type models that are out there and, and probably more, more well known? Oh, well, the, the, first of all, okay, it deals with people's temperament, right. right, which is very important. So you're dealing with emotions, okay, or your emotional predisposition. And just knowing what, being able to work out quickly what two people's components are, as a, the dominant two components is a huge advantage when you're dealing with them, when you want to gain their support, right? The second is actually scientifically valid. I mean, the thirdly, it's practical. Right, for example, all right, and why is it practical? Because it's law has seven components, right? And seven is a limit of your short term memory, and that's the number of components. That's so, right. According to George Miller, that's what right. is it? The, the magic the number seven, seven plus or plus minus, minus two. two. And the main thing is it's got three things. It's based on temperament, not emotions. Everyone in emotional intelligence is all talking about emotions. We go through my best estimates between four thousand and nine thousand emotional states during that day. Right, you just give you, and you go. I thought it was that many, but I know, no, no, but that's there's, there's effectively studies have been shown. There's a, there's a, you know, that's just the reality, and that's that was quoted to me by a guy called Broad Mark Brackett. I went, went I sp I've spoken at a couple of emotional intelligence conferences, and he gave a talk, and that was his, that was his estimate, four thousand. But there's a thing called six seconds, and ninety five percent of the time, people are in some emotional state. And the average emotional state according to six seconds last six seconds. So if you work it out and the people who have 16 hours, you come up with 9,000 states. Right. So you say, well, that's no use to you. I mean, it's, that's like, you know, saying I'm going to, you know, program computers at the electron level. You want to basically be much higher up. And learning, learning people in terms of temperament is much better. Secondly, you may as well use a system which is scientifically valid, which is, the, you know, the five factor model. But, but I actually think the hum is better. Okay, I was seven, well, I was 17 years. But the five that. factor model is that ocean. Ocean, that's it. Openness to creativity, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And that has got a lot of uh, academic uh, acceptance currently. Totally, right. Now, what happens with the hum is the five most common factors match up with the five factors of the five factor model. Right. It has an additional two. One is the hustler, yes. right, and the other is the politician. Yes. Now, the interesting thing about it is those are the two most common characteristics found in managers, right? Most managers get there because they are, they're, they're shrewd, they're flexible, they want to win, they're competitive, they're assertive, right? Now, these are qualities that, I mean, I'm, I'm pick, talking particularly in corporate politics, right? And, you know, it's just, so that's, that's effectively the model in a nutshell. And in, in dealing with all these types. Now, as an example of where I use it, I can give you two right now. They do with the, the first one was Alan and Unwin, and what Alan and Unwin, which is uh, publishers, publisher of, of basically enterprise of venture capital. Oh right, right. Okay, so what happened was they invited um, a woman called Enda Carew. She was the leading financial writer at the time in, in Australia, and they said we want to do a book on venture capital. And she very kindly said, "Look, it's really not my area." He said, there's this young guy called Chris Golis, because I was much younger then. Remember, this is the 1980s. And he said, he's written, he, he's on the JASA board, he's written several articles. He's become one of Australia's first venture capitalists. He's not a bad writer. Why don't you have a talk with him? And so I get this phone call, and this chap says, my name's John Ironmonger. He said, I'm a publisher with Alan Unwin. And Nick Carew has recommended you come along uh, from, when we meet. Why don't we go for lunch? Uh, I've got this little Italian trattoria I like in North Sydney. So I said, okay, that's fair enough. Yeah, so I'll meet you. So we took, I took down the address. You know, this is, this is basically 1988, post the 87 crash. And we, I went to trattoria and I'm sitting at the table. You always arrive early, right? And I see this guy walk in. He's wearing an Armani leather jacket, silk shirt, cravat, has a beard. He's avoiding eye contact. And of course, I said, of course, I said to myself, he's, he's an artist, as according to the book, one of the profiles. These people are introverts. They're going to be reading a lot of manuscripts, et cetera. They're going to be quiet spoken, et cetera. 
and you know I sort of met. So now I've got only one problem, right? Artists don't like me on an oh, emotion, okay. emotional level, right? Because I'm noisy, I'm brag, I'm assertive, and that's the kind of people they don't like. So I'm sitting down and I'm avoiding his eye contact and mumbling away in my hands. These are all techniques you use. And he sent me hands across the wine list and said, why did you choose the wine? So I looked at him and suddenly said, sure. So I went to the wine list and I went to, I said, I like reds at lunchtime. And I chose the most expensive red on the menu, right? This was 1988 and it was a $400 bottle of red. And I said, look, you buy lunch and I handed across my American Express card. I said, put the wine on my card. And he looked at me and he said, there's a sort of long pause. And, the, I, and when you're a salesperson, you know, when, when you're at that pause, you say nothing, right? And he said, are you sure you, you want that wine? And I said, the rest of the wines on this list are un undrinkable, right? I sort of said, look, don't worry about it. Put it on my card and you know, you just buy the lunch. And he said, no, he said, the publisher always buys the first lunch. So I always say to people, is he going to publish the book? This episode is brought to you by Global X. Since 2008, Global X ETFs has been committed to empowering investors with unexplored intelligent solutions. Global X specializes in exchange-traded funds that offer exposure to the artificial intelligence ecosystem, including themes like data centers, robotics, semiconductors, and cloud computing. To learn more about Global X's entire suite of ETFs, from covered calls, fixed income, emerging markets, and more, visit GlobalXETFs.com. What would you say? I'm going to say yes. Yes, yeah, because he has enough respect for you and your taste to think that you probably a man of discernment and distinction. Very nice of you to say that, Nita. Okay, here are my two takes. <laughs> First of all, is he going back to his boss and say, here's a, say the lunch cost $100 each. Is he going to give the boss, his boss an expense claim for 600 bucks and say, by the way, we're not doing the book? The answer is no. <laughs> right. He's duty bound. Yeah, okay. But secondly, artists, what artists like, most of all, this is the important thing. They like individual people who are individual. I mean, they like creative people, people who are different. So anyway, it was very funny because when the book actually got published, I took him to my club and I bought lunch this next time. Just because I knew the book could be, I was hoping it was going to be useful. Didn't realize it was going to be as useful as it was. Um, and then we had a very expensive bread. And I said, by the way, you know, what actually, how did you feel? And he said, well, you don't, you see, because you don't understand it. He said, I've probably taken 100 authors to lunch. And I said, yeah, I can believe that. And he said, about a third say I don't drink at lunchtime. A third say I'll just have the carafe. And then the final third, right? He said, basically choose the second least expensive wine on the menu. And we all know that's the one the restaurant has set up have the biggest gross margin. It's actually probably the worst wine than the one in the Quran. He uh -huh. said, you are the only prospective author I've ever met who's chosen the most expensive wine on the menu. And he said, I just couldn't believe it when you did it. And he said, I knew you were, and the point is, I knew you were a different sort of individual from the average author, right? So that's what happened. And yes, he did the book. If you publish the book, you're then asked, you know, do you have a second book? Every author's asked that question. Now you're a published author, of course. You're, you're yeah. so Chan, so Alan Norman said, You say, Well, no, funnily enough, what happened is when I what happened was I went to TNT as the general manager, they had a selling system based, believe it or not, on the number seven. The guy who developed it was a guy called Keith Stevenson, right? And he, he could, what happened was he had read Miller's paper, right? And he was so by so what happened was he had seven objections seven closes, seven ways of handling objections, the, ma the magic number seven. We've three. actually got the seven keys in our selling skills too. <laughs> That's absolutely important, right? Because it's, it's, a, it's a limited short term memory. And what, what um, Keith Stevens said, if one close fails, try another one. And I said, no, no, no. Each of the selling um, closes matches up with one of the seven type traits, okay? So I said, for example, the most famous close in selling is probably the minor one point close. You don't say, do you want to buy the car? You say, do you want it on manual or an automatic, right? Impl implicitly saying you're going to buy the car. Do you want it in black or gray or white? Okay. 
and letting the person make the decision right, on a minor point. Now, why is this so important? Well, that's because most managers have some politician in them, right? That's one of the, one of the strongest components. I mean, it's, it's not to be. So why is it the most common sales? Because it's the one that works with most managers, right? So that's what happened. So what happened was I basically married and developed this, joined the Humwads with the TNT selling system. And what I say is while I was at TNT, sales doubled, okay, well, sorry, sales doubled, revenues quadrupled, right? Um, profit went up 10 times and our return on investment in our final year was the highest of any division in worldwide in TNT. It was about 172%. I mean, I was the star of superior areas, but of course I was having my midlife crisis, right? But what happened was in the last 18 months I was there, we were involved in 15 major tenders. This is like ESO, uh, Medicare. I mean, we these are major big corporations. ESO is a big uh, oil company. Medicare yes, is the medical big, uh, supplier. Yes, sorry, yes. I mean, so these were major things. So what happened was, um, we were involved, as I said, in 18 major tenders, or 15 major tenders in the last 18 months. And on a market share basis, we should have won one or two. We won all 15, right? That's a hundred percent. isn't it? That's 100%. I know, I know. We won all 15. And I w remember one of my colleagues in the business school said, well, obviously your prices is too, too low. And I said, that's exactly what I was thinking when I was closing the deal with the financial director of ESSO. And he told me that he was never going to sign because we were basically three times more expensive than the nearest competition. And I said to him, look, you're a shoot individual. We're the only one who can do the payroll. I don't care. But at the moment, you're give, this is when the bad straight oil fields are going. You're sending back a couple of million dollars every week to have so head, so head office, I said, in royalty fees. And I said, if the, if the oil workers go on strike because you can't pay them correctly, the one who loses his job is you. And frankly, I don't care. So you got your choice. You either choose a system. This guy was a raging edge, right? And I said, you got to talk to them basic. I said, either you choose the system that's going to work for you, or you choose a system that's going to lose you your job. Your choice. Wow. So I'm signing this. I'll never forget it. He said, I'm signing this contract under duress. I said, I know you're not. You're signing it. It's the happiest customer I have at the moment because you know you've made the right decision. Anyway. We got along like a house on fire. He said, Chris, no other salesperson has ever, so we, we, we would go out to lunch. I'd be down, down in Melbourne and we'd, we'd go out to lunch about once a quarter And because it was a huge account. I mean, you know, because everyone knew, mate, the, the, the unions on those oil fields, they were the toughest negotiators you've ever seen in your life. The, the changes in the award were just, it was oh. like about that thick. Anyway, oh. and he just said, um, you know, he, he just said, you know, you're the one guy who's ever stood up to me, but he had a bit of pain as well. And he said, it was just absolutely fantastic dealing with you. So we always go along well, right? And this is what happens. So that's, that's very important. And that's, now I wouldn't do that with someone else. But, but I'm also me. hearing that you're the consummate salesperson as well. Well, because that, that takes, that's a provocative uh, answer and to, to a statement and, but it worked. And oh, but, yeah. oh yeah, well, you gotta be, you gotta, have to, you gotta call the mark, right? But that's, yeah. I, but I'm not, I'm not better at it. Anyway, just to get refresh on the everything sense, so what happened was I gave him his copy. I'd written a book when I was, this is when I was transitioning across the business. So I'd written it all down in a book. I call it cycle selling, right? And then what, what, that was the, the original draft. And they came back and they said, look, it's not bad, but they said books on selling don't sell. Anyway, what happened was, and I thought it was saw you. So I called on Joe Hickson, who at that time was Australia's leading literary agent. She found, for example, Bryce Courtney, you know, the power of one. So that was her big claim to fame. And I went, I rang her up, went across in the blue suit, you know, looking like this classic investor and banker. And I thought I was going to be meeting a high A because she's in publishing, same thing. I, I mean, what's an A? Artist. Oh, okay. artist. Okay. Yeah, I and I get there and she starts name dropping, me, name dropping me from one end of Sydney to the other. Oh, I see you're a banker's trust. Do you know X? And I suddenly went, I'm dealing with a hustler here. <laughs> and I said, of course she's a hustler. She's the middleman between publishers and authors. That's how she makes it. She gets, makes you know, both people happy to do a deal. She's the middleman. She's a wholesaler. She's an agent. I said, you idiot. Of course she's an H. Right. So oh. I immediately, so she said, you know, I said, well, I, you know, had dinner, lunch with him in the establishment last Friday. 
I mean, I'm lying through my teeth, but you know, but I'm name dropping yes, I said, you know, did you go back? Oh, we were having a great time in Machiavelli's a couple of weeks ago, which was at that a time. restaurant. That's one of the top, you know, top is the top best top Italian restaurant in Sydney. It was at yeah. that time the best Italian restaurant in Sydney. Yeah. So I was, so she was name dropping me and I was name dropping her back. So I left the manuscript with her and I rang her up about three weeks later and she, she told me she doesn't do nonfiction. And she said, oh, Chris, we're getting the book published. I said, what do you mean? I thought you didn't like nonfiction. She said, no, 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 no. I've read, when I read the chapter, this is the chapter of Kate Hustler, she said, it's the only thing which has described my husband I've ever read. And he said, she said, I have read loads of articles about him, right? No one's got inside his head like you have. Now, of course, people who are overseas will realize he was the premier of New South Wales for Neville Rand. Right. For, for basically seven years. He was nicknamed Nifty, incredibly astute, right? Won something like three elections and basically transformed the Labour Party in this country. We became very successful because Hawke and Keating emulated them. Labour had his most powerful run following the path that Nifty set. And he was a great A.H. And the, the follow up to the story is absolutely wonderful. Is I was, she, we were meeting, uh, discussing the book, I was meeting with Jill. <laughs> And she said, I said, I saw your husband walking down Bridge Street the other day. And she said, yes. And I said, I didn't recognize him in the distance, but I saw he was wearing this bright red tie. And I said, my God, there, wa there walks a hustler. And I say to people, try to get into a selling role to learn about it, because that's fantastic experience if you can get it. And then second, use a pro profiling system, which is valid, reliable, okay, practical and easy to use. And it works on temperament not just all your various emotions. And, and, and a manager who either buys your book or buys your online course, and I think your website is emotionalintelligencecourse.com? Yes. What I'm offering people, if they actually sign up for the course, I'll, I can check it. If they send me an email with their mailing address, I'll send them a copy, signed copy of the Haman book. Right. Wow. Well, I don't know how long that will. Uh, you need to put a, 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 a an end date on that because this uh, this uh, recording will last a long time. Oh no, no, I don't mind. It's okay. Just as it, I, it'll, it'll, it, the offer is open to the books run out. Anyway, go to the website, sign up for the course, and get a free copy and, of the Hum Handbook. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and the information will be in the show notes. Thank you. Okay, Thanks, great. everybody. Okay, Ciao for now. Bye, bye. Great bye. to talk to you, everyone. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.